So half the message for those who are catching up on YouTube. We've only gotten halfway through. You're going to miss a lot. We're up to verse 2. And Peter is sharing this message of love to his congregation while in prison. And this is not a new message. And he comes to their message. And he says that many will follow. He's talking about the messengers of this message. And he says many will follow their sensuality. And because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed. I want you to think about the worship. Think of the worship of, of the world right now in the evangelical church. What kind of worship do we seek? A kind of worship that makes us feel something, that desires something of God. It's what we want from God, right? Think of the Hillsong and the Bethel and the Elevation Churches. It's the teaching of the number one. What makes me feel good? What can I get from God? It's all about feelings and blessings and the presence of angels and gold dust and all that kind of stuff. Miracles and the gifts. Is that what God is about? Or is he is about his glory, making himself known through his salvation to the nations and through his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ? That's why we don't do those songs anymore. Watch out for those guys who preach, you can be number one, guys like. Joel Osteen and Kenneth Copeland and Joyce Mayer, Sid Roth and Benny Hinn and Stephen Furtick. Because of verse 3. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Listen to what they say. They will beg you for money. And what will they say about the money? They will say the money will give you something. They say that, that if you give, you will get blessings. That's a lie. That's bargaining with God. God doesn't bargain. You can't make God do anything. And we're going to see that in the next verse. They're exploiting you with false words. Because the result for them, they think, they think, is, is that they're going to be really really happy and get off get off with it but God is not idle and their destruction is not asleep because they think God is not listening God is not aware of what they're doing because in verse 4 we go to some history and if God did not spare the angels, notice, they command him. He commands the angels. He commands everything. And these guys, they command him. They 
decree, they declare. Who dares to do that to God? Not even the angels do that. He judges angels, and in, as we carry on further down, he puts the whole world under water under judgment. Who is righteous? He judges Sodom and Gomorrah, a whole city. You know, he could do that today if he wanted to. Destroy every single one of us. Because what does Paul say? Who is righteous among us? Not one. Who seeks after God? Not one of us. But he does make a point of saying that there is a righteous person in each one of these cases. That he is chosen out of grace to save a person or save a family here in these stories. Noah out of one, Lot out of another. Why does he do that? Does he do it because they're better than those other people? No, he does it out of grace and out of love. He does it out of mercy. If we were compared with Sodom and Gomorrah, God would be right in destroying us. Those who are his in Christ and until the day of judgment, he, is, he saves. God is good. And he has kept you and he will keep you. And he keeps you through trials, as he says in the passage. He may not take you out of the trial, but the trial of this that he's talking about here, this trial of error, he can bring you through it. Because this is one of the worst ones, and one of the hardest ones to get through. Notice that he says something very strange. I'm not going to just gloss over because that gloomy darkness and that whole thing, but it's good to pay attention that he doesn't just... That punishment is very severe. The punishment is very severe. It's condemnation language of the utmost. This is what is going to happen to the ungodly. But he rescues the righteous lot. He rescues Noah and he rescues the elect. He rescues those he saves. And we know how he does that, right? He does that by saving his people through the Lord Jesus Christ. But what are these people doing? They're hiding that from you. They're obfuscating it. They're putting it in a mist so you can't see who Jesus is anymore. This is not a passage of moral superiority. This is not a passage of sexuality and adultery and all of that it's a passage about teaching it's a passage about fear and trembling and humbly and humility and about warning i want you to remember the word amongst you Amongst you are false teachers, and amongst you are false prophets. And he has described their attitude here. I'm just trying to see where we are. Verse 11. I think it's verse 11. Verse 10. 
they indulge, if you see in there, what they do. Verse 10, what do they do? They indulge in the lust of defiling passion. One. And they are bold and willful and do not tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones where angels do not dare to speak a judgment against them before the Lord. So they speak words which they are. They speak of things just you hear them speak about going to heaven or going to hell, all sorts of things, where Paul would not even utter a word. They speak of spiritual things like it's candy floss. And in verse 12, he says, but these like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming about matters which are of which they are ignorant will also be destroyed in their destruction he's not using animals in a in a sense of a eschatological argument that's meaning an end times argument he's using them in an argument in a sense where they are being used where you see them in a stampede what are they going to do they're going to do anything to just run over anything to survive. If you drop a piece of meat inside a piranha tank, what's going to happen to the piece of meat? They're not going to think. They're just going to devour that piece of meat covered in blood. They're not going to think about it, are they? They're just going to do what that nature inside them says. They're going to do anything to get it, even if they have to eat the piranha in front of them. They do not think about what they say except how it will profit them or how to get them out of a bad situation they might be in already. Pleasure, fear, anger, greed. But suffering wrong is the wage of the wrongdoing, but they counted pleasure to revel in the daytime. Listen to this. But they are blots and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions while they are feasts with you. While they feast with you. Think about that. They feast with you. These are the guys you watch on Bible television, you listen to them on the radio, you put them in the car, you take them home with you. You support their ministries. They're in your home. They're in your hearts. You let them in. You buy their books. They're at your feasts. And in verse 14, they have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. This is a misunderstood verse. So, you know, I've said that this has got nothing to do with sexuality and all of that. When, I, when it says they have eyes full of adultery, he's talking about an Old Testament allusion to adultery, which means that they are idolatrous. Because when we see the language of idolatry in the Old Testament, it is referred to as adultery. We see it in Hosea, we see it in Exodus. My people are an adulterous people. They go after other gods. So when these teachers are leading God's people astray, we become an adulterous people. 
And these teachers are an adulterous teachers. These are adulterous teachers because they are not teaching the same Jesus. They are not teaching the same God. And see what they do. They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. Because what are they teaching? They're teaching greed, right? They entice unsteady souls. Trained. They are trained. They have hearts trained in greed. Accursed children. The Greek there is... Gataras Tekna. That's the word for cauterizing children. Cut off children. Cut off. In verse 15, we have to ask what are they teaching? Does it matter? Of course it does. Because only the gospel, who God is, Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, sent by the Father, right? Sent by the Father to die for us in our place, for our sin, to be raised to life and is now in glory. And if you are in him, have died in him and have been raised in him, alive to God and his Holy Spirit lives in you that is what is the gospel and that is what makes you a, a believer all this other stuff that you're hearing why would you want it why would anyone want it because you're alive and you're alive to God forever if you're poor here now, you're rich for eternity. If you die here now, you're alive forever. What are these people teaching? That's so great. We've spoken about Balaam and his donkey before. We know what he was. Balak came to him to curse Israel. He paid him. That's what he did. That's where we got to. And that's where I'm going to have to stop today. I've got a lot more to say. But if I go on... A lot longer. I think we're going to lose you all. And I'm good. And there is so much to say. Now, Balaam, he was paid. And he would say anything for money. And we know what God did to Balaam. Balaam sorted him out. He tried to stop him on the road by making his donkey speak to him and tell him off. He put an angel in his path as well. And his donkey told him off. But he still went. And God eventually put words in his mouth and said, if you don't say what I say, you'll die. But he was still being paid. And... He was eventually killed. But these guys today, Balaam is a prophet, was a prophet, like these guys dressed up today. They're just more dressed up. The cracks will show when the gospel of God's word tests their faith because they have no faith you know I should go should say something a little bit further because verse 18 gives us all a serious warning these teachers 
that Peter warns us about. They have a disastrous end. They're not teaching us that you too can have that, you know. You, you can have that, you can have that. But it's false. But when you listen and follow, you barely escape with your lives. You don't. You end up in the same place. That's the warning. All that hell and that gloom, you end up with them. And in verse 19, you see what they promise? They promise freedom. Do you get freedom? The same thing attracts the listener, and we become slaves of that. They are greedy. And greed attracts greed. Did we become slaves to greed? Did Christ come for us to become slaves to sensuality in our worship? Or did he come to set us free, and free indeed? One more thing, and then I'll close for today. I started to say who is number one, right? Peter, in the last days of his life, right? Remember when he started his life? He may have been number one, number one fisherman, trying to be the number one fisherman. But when he met Jesus, he found someone who was really the number one, the number one of the world, of the universe, the person who saved him and taught him what love really was, what salvation was. And because Jesus is number one, and because he is the, the Lord of all, the King of all, and the Almighty God. Because he does all he says he does. Because he saved Peter, forgave him, changed his life, changes all our lives if we trust in him. Transforms our lives entirely from this side of eternity to the next You do go to him and you can go to him in your trials your Difficulties He does hear you and yes, he may not take you out of them Justin Martyr still went to his death Peter still went to his death Polycarp still went to his death But you won't go to it on your own. And you won't go to it on the world's terms, but on God's terms. And you always know his love. You always know how Peter and all God's people and how God loves and how he has been able to love his people so much. And be able to do the same. And that's something that we would never be able to do on our own. And that's really something. I mean, that's how he was able to warn them like this. And he even loved those who were the false teachers who he was warning. That's the message for today. So... If you know people who are going astray, warn them lovingly. Hear the message of the gospel and not that message and want them to go away from it and come to the cross. All right, let's pray. Lord Jesus, the gospel is power. It is truth, it is strength. 
the power to come to the Lord Jesus Christ who died for us. Thank you, Jesus, that you did, that you are able to forgive sin, that you have, and that you were able to forgive our sin. Thank you for that, and thank you that you rose from the dead and are in glory and have all authority and all power, and that you are in our lives by the Holy Spirit, and you carry us along, that we do not carry you along, because you are almighty. In Jesus' name, amen.